I certainly have the belief that Gladys Berejiklian is not what she's represented uh, to the public. And I think as more and more of these things happen and the hubris comes on display, the public will, will get a sense of that as well. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And after deflecting attention from her boyfriend's dodgy deals and winning over the media with her tale of love gone wrong, New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian is under fire again. And this time, she's shooting the messenger. Very strong efforts were made to intimidate us into not publishing the story and to threaten us in some way. There was a very strong sense that we would be shamed and embarrassed by the Premier's office were we to persist with publication. So, what was the story that so upset the Premier's staff? Not the shredding of documents by her office and her claim that everyone's into pork barrelling. Last Tuesday, the Australian state politics reporter Yoni Bashan hit the front page with yet another damaging report. Berejiklian breached isolation test protocol. This was an embarrassing tale of hypocrisy on the part of the Premier, who had contradicted her own advice by taking a Covid test and not staying home and who would then stonewall the Oz as it tried to confirm the story. The Australian asked Ms Berejiklian's office numerous times when she undertook her test, when she received her results, and whether she attended any meetings in the intervening period. These questions remain unanswered. The Premier did finally answer questions on Nine's Today Show, but only after the Australian's front page revelations. You're in trouble again. What's going on? I'm not in trouble, no. Did you breach your own rules? Yeah. Well, look, um, I've just laid out the facts, um, uh, Carl, and I'll let others make that call. The facts were the Premier was in breach, but over on the ABC, she still had to be dragged kicking and screaming to an admission. And I didn't have any symptoms. I didn't have a sore th or scratchy throat. I didn't have a runny nose. I but didn't have any symptoms. But you took a test and I didn't self-isolate. And the guidelines say if you take no, a test, true, true. you have to self-isolate. No, I accept that. So you didn't follow your I, own I guidelines. You do accept that you didn't follow your own guidelines. Yeah, I accept that in hindsight I should have kept my door shut for the 90 minutes or the two hours until I was waiting for the result. I do accept that. It was hardly a mea culpa and she still had not come clean, as Yoni Bashan revealed next day in a front page follow-up. Gladys Berejiklian entered Parliament and voted on a piece of legislation while awaiting test results for a potential COVID-19 infection. In which Bashan and the Oz repeated their allegations of... Repeated efforts by her office to disrupt publication of the article using threats and warnings that action would be taken if wildly inaccurate allegations were printed. Yes, the Premier's spin machine was in overdrive and the office had allegedly been playing dirty. With correspondence from the Premier's office suggesting, says Bashan... If we were to publish this story, uh, we would encounter grief and I would be shamed for doing so. Berejiklian's press office is run by Sean Berry, who once reported politics for Seven News, and who also spent time as a Kremlin anchorman on the state-backed Russia Today, where, as he told Telegraph readers in 2014, he felt a creeping pro-Russia influence. And that comparison was irresistible for Sky News political editor Andrew Clonell. I know Sean used to work for Russia Today. Maybe he still thinks he's there. On Sky last week, Clonell called out Berry and the tactics of his team. And there's bullying and intimidation. And... Uh... My concern is that there is a dirty culture developing in this government and with this Premier. Clemel, of course, has editorialised strongly against the Premier in recent months, and Bashan has tangled with the Premier's office before. But other press gallery players tell us the intimidation goes above and beyond usual media relationships, with one describing the Premier's approach to the media as Trump-like in its hostility. So, what does Sean Berry have to say for himself? Well, he agrees... Relationships with journalists can be robust, but he denies any threats or intimidation and says he never attempted to suppress the original story in The Australian. In a statement, he told me to watch. With no specifics, it's difficult to comment on so-called strong-arm tactics, other than to note that the nature of my job could upset some reporters, while at the same time pleasing others. However, I will not apologise for urging journalists to be accurate and fair in their reporting, nor in my defence of the government against false claims. And you can read a full statement from him on our website. Meanwhile, speaking of political spin, let's head to this News Corp exclusive about another esteemed political leader. Lockdown at the Lodge. What life in ISO is like for ScoMo. That story ran across most of News Corp's Sunday papers and was syndicated in the West's Sunday Times. And the man who made it possible is the PM's official photographer, Adam Taylor, who's been in quarantine with the PM after his trip abroad. Taylor got the scoop on ScoMo in thongs, Shorts and suit jacket, working out on the bike, 
and diligently at the desk and getting his Covid tests. And once the News Corp Sundays had showcased them, TV News loved them too. Locked down at the lodge through the lens of the Prime Minister's official photographer. It's business upstairs and leisure down as the Prime Minister adapts to lockdown in the lodge. The PM's photographer providing a glimpse of his life in quarantine. Yes, Taylor's snapshots got a good flogging, but on ABC Insiders there was criticism too. At the end of the day, this is just Scotty from marketing. You said it all when you said it was his official photographer uh, taking the photograph. But he's not the first Prime Minister to be engaged in marketing ploys and he certainly won't be the last, uh, but he is very good at it. So, does it matter if the media are lapping up the PM's PR? And does it stop us seeing pictures that aren't staged? According to one of the few remaining Parliament House photographers, the answer is yes. The more the newspapers are running the Adam Taylor photos, the less access we're getting. And according to Mick Sikas, those shots of the PM in lockdown are a case in point. We asked if we could take a photo of Scott Morrison in quarantine from behind the fence. My colleague at AAP asked for it. The Prime Minister's office said, yeah, we'll get back to you. Never heard back. There are now only three or four full-time news photographers covering Canberra politics, and none of them are News Corp staffers. So it's no surprise that The Australian is one of the biggest fans of the PM's positive portfolio. There was this formidable team shot in October, the PM laying a wreath on Remembrance Day. And this fireside portrait at the lodge with the PM working on his pre-budget address. But nowhere did the Australian make it clear that Adam Taylor is the PM's official photographer. And it's not just News Corp. Nearly all outlets have been guilty of doing the same. Rewind to March and you may remember the PM's fitness gaffe. Yoga. Uh, Barre, I hope I've pronounced that correct. I might need some help with that. Um, I'm not quite sure what that is, to be honest. Well, now he is sure, because two weeks ago, ScoMo dropped into a Melbourne bar studio and we were duly treated to these Adam Taylor images in the Daily Mail and the Australian. Once again, great PR for our leader, but the credits gave you little or no clue that these were taken by the PM's man. Now, there's no question Taylor is a pro, but surely readers have a right to know who his client is. And they should be told they're being bombarded with blatant political marketing, which is what this is. We asked the PM's office whether Taylor is now full-time in his employment at taxpayers' expense, but we got absolutely no response. So instead, we'll have a comment from The Guardian's Catherine Murphy, who told readers... Morrison is the most assiduous social media influencer since Kevin Rudd. And who added... It's not candid or spontaneous. It's calculated professional projection. It is bizarre that a news outlet would take these images and present them to readers as something found and real. We reckon Taylor's pictures should be stamped with Prime Minister's official photographer, so no one is in any doubt. And the media who run them should be honest enough to admit it. But now to the courts and a rare win for journalists and publishers after a case that lasted three years and cost millions of dollars. Chelms for doctors lose bid to rewrite history in defamation case. Yes, ABC News journalist Steve Kinane won hands down in the federal court last week with the judge awarding costs against deep sleep therapists John Gill and John Heron. And a relieved Kinane told MediaWatch... When we found out, it was a great feeling. Um, this was such an important case. We knew it meant a lot to not just us, but to a lot of other people as well. The victims of Chelmsford, journalists, publishers. It was real victory for truth, for a great publisher standing up for itself and it's for its author as well, um, but also the victims of Chelmsford. And also a great victory against people who are trying to rewrite history. So what was the case all about? Well, in his 2016 book Fair Game, Kinane re-examined one of the darkest chapters in Australia's psychiatric history, the Chelmsford Deep Sleep Scandal, which was exposed by 60 Minutes and then in 1990 by a Royal Commission, reported here by ABC News. This building in the northern suburb of Pennant Hills was once Chelmsford Hospital a place where hundreds of psychiatric patients with often only minor problems were plied with barbiturates and sent into a deep sleep for weeks at a time. The Royal Commission found that in the 13 years until 1977, the therapy led to the deaths of 24 patients and another 24 killed themselves within a year after treatment. The Royal Commission laid much of the blame on the hospital's chief psychiatrist, Dr Harry Bailey, who took his own life while under investigation. But it also found two other doctors to be culpable. The judge described Bailey's assistant, Dr John Heron, as a man who knew much but revealed little. And Dr John Gill, he said, must bear a large part of the responsibility. And it was those two doctors who sued Kinane for defamation. So, were they the focus of his book? Answer, not at all. 
Gill was mentioned once in one chapter, Heron 13 times. The focus of my book was the Church of Scientology. There was one chapter that referred to Chelmsford, but essentially that chapter was about an undercover operation where the Scientologists put a nurse in to Chelmsford Hospital who stole medical records and exposed what went on there. So my book and even this chapter really wasn't about Chelmsford, but in writing that chapter, I had to refer to what happened there. And to write that, I referred to the Royal Commission findings. And so what this defamation case was about was them trying to overturn established facts and findings from that Royal Commission. Last week, after a seven-week trial, Canaan and Harper Collins emerged victorious, with Justice Jane Jago delivering a damning assessment of Heron and Gill's case, finding that they were... ..fixated on a single objective, to have the findings in this proceeding rewrite history and vindicate their conduct, despite the overwhelming evidence to the contrary and the lack of any cogent evidence to support them. And amazingly, Justice Jago then found... I would have accepted that in the relevant sector of his reputation as a medical practitioner, Mr Heron has no residual reputation to be protected. It must be accepted that Dr Gill was held in very low estimation by the relevant sector of society before the publication of the matter complained of. So, if that was the case, why on earth did the court have to go through the whole painful process? And why was Canaan forced to prove in court at great length that the Royal Commission's findings were true? These are established facts. These are established findings from 30 years ago. I thought I could rely upon them in my book and that I wouldn't have to defend them. And what we had to do, in, in essence, was relitigate a Royal Commission with people where many of them were dead, and it was a very difficult thing to do. And were you surprised that the court didn't throw it out? I was surprised the court didn't throw it out, but I understand Jago's judgment uh, and why she didn't throw it out. She was essentially saying they had... Uh, a right to have a day in court. But what I don't understand is you get to the end of this process that takes over three years, that costs millions of dollars, and you find out that they have no real reputation that could be harmed. So why can't we find that out at the beginning of the process and not have to go through a three-year court case that costs millions of dollars? Victory is sweet, but it came at a great cost to all parties, including the plaintiffs, one of whom put his house on the line. And, of course, to the victims, the author and the publisher, owned by News Corp, who were also put through the mill. But Canaan believes it was absolutely worth fighting for, and not just for him. Sometimes media organisations and publishers hang out their journalists to dry when they have told the truth, and they make a simple commercial decision to do that. This was a great uh, case where the publisher backed the author and said there are massive principles at stake here about the truth, about justice, and about the rewriting of history. So I think this um, is important for both the push to reform defam defamation law, but I think it's also important that publishers stand up for their authors and their journalists. In that respect, Canaan was fortunate. And with luck, others may not have to go through his ordeal. Because, as we highlighted in August, changes to defamation laws are on the way in all states, and Dr Matt Collins QC is pretty confident they will protect responsible investigative journalism. He told me to watch. The reforms will introduce a new defence for publications concerning an issue of public interest, where the defendant reasonably believed that the publication of the matter was in the public interest. The combination of the new defence and Canaan's success in this case, and the catastrophic and no doubt very expensive loss for the plaintiffs, would surely make cases like this less likely in future. And that has to be good news for the media. That's all from us tonight. There's more on our website where you can stream or download the program and read statements from Dr Matt Collins and Sean Berry. And don't forget Media Bytes every Thursday on your favourite social media platform. But for now until next week, goodbye.